Hello, everyone. I'm Dilek Vardas, Executive Secretary of the Inspection Panel. Welcome to this virtual session sponsored by the Inspection Panel, focusing on the meaning of recently approved Inspection Panel reforms for project-affected communities. As I'm sure most of you know, the World Bank Board of Executive Directors recently completed a three-year review of the panel's operations that began following the board's approval of the bank's new environmental and social framework. The review resulted in the establishment of the World Bank Accountability Mechanism, which is expected to begin operations early next year and will house both the panel to conduct compliance reviews and a new dispute resolution service, which will offer project affected communities and borrowing countries another way to resolve their issues if they so choose. The review also added new tools to the inspection panel. The board agreed to allow communities more time, up to 15 months after the closure of new projects, to file complaints and gave the panel the authority with board approval to verify the implementation of management action plans in some cases. The board also permitted the sharing of the panel's investigation report with complainants before it is considered by the board to allow them to be more meaningfully engaged in consultations on the development of the management action plan. Finally, the board authorized the panel to provide advisory services in the form of lessons from its cases to support institutional learning. The panel has already begun issuing uh, using these latter two tools. The resolutions approved by the board last month to enact all of these changes can be found, uh, found on the board's website as well as the website of the inspection panel. It is important to note that the Accountability Mechanism Secretary, who will be hired to head the Accountability Mechanism, will report to the board and be independent of bank management. The panel, as it has since it was created in 1993, as the first independent accountability mechanism at an international financial institution, will continue to report to the board on compliance matters and operate independently of management. The panel members will coordinate with, but not be subject to the supervision of the Accountability Mechanism Secretary. The panel looks forward to working with all stakeholders as part of the World Bank Accountability Mechanism to continue to provide a way for communities harmed by bank projects to have their voices heard at the highest levels of the institution. Here with me today to discuss the changes approved by the board are World Bank Executive Director Jürgen Zettler. As the chair of the board's Committee on Development Effectiveness, Jürgen has helped shepherd these changes through the review process over the last two years. Imrana Jalal, chair, chair of the inspection panel. Imrana became panel chair in December 2018 and was centrally involved in the final year and a half of the board review. Jolie Schwartz, Policy Director of the Bank Information Center. Jolie regularly engages with the panel and other independent accountability mechanisms on their work in the end is extremely knowledgeable about the just completed board review. Thanks to all for you two for participating. Our plan is to begin with short opening statements from our speakers on today's topic. What do the changes recently approved by the board to strengthen banks' environmental and social accountability mean for project-affected communities? We will have plenty of time for questions and answers. If you would like to ask a question, please indicate that by writing on the YouTube chat page. Please include your name and affiliation with your questions. We will get to as many questions as we can. We are recording today's session. It will be available on panel's website and its YouTube channel by the end of the day. So let's start. Jorgen, would you like to begin? 
Yes, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dilek, and good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to to kick off, and uh, I think the the question uh, in the room is what uh, those uh, reforms mean for uh, communities and for for project um, affected people. And um, as you already have uh, said, Dilek, uh, we. We're agreeing on seven reform areas, and I will quickly go through the most important ones in order to highlight what it really means for uh, project uh, affected uh, people. I, I think uh, all of those reform areas have a benefit uh, for uh, the people uh, out there. And uh, this is perhaps most obvious uh, that the first reform area you already were mentioning the newly established dispute resolution function. Um, and uh, there you all know that uh, we haven't had that function uh, before. Uh, when there were problems around a, around a project, uh, the normal way was uh, to ask for an investigation. And you also know that these investigations take a long time, uh, can take years. And uh, sometimes they even do not bring immediate um, uh, relief of harm. So uh, this is a, a new function, dispute resolution. Uh, it will be done by independent mediators. And um, the objective is to find mutually acceptable uh, outcomes. Uh, and um, uh, this is an, uh, a voluntary uh, function, so uh, communities and people can opt uh, for this uh, function. Uh, if it doesn't um, play out well, uh, if there is no agreement, then there will be the other option uh, to go for a uh, full-fledged uh, investigation. So this is additional. That's the first uh, and very substantial uh, point which improved the situation for uh, the communities and for the people. The second area is um, the better sharing of information with requesters. You also mentioned that point. In future, the uh, inspection panel uh, will be allowed uh, to share the findings uh, of the inspection uh, panel investigation reports with the requesters. And uh, this can be done ahead uh, of the board meetings. Therefore, the information, the feedback can be fed into the board meetings. And this will, will give in requesters an opportunity uh, to, to hold, an, for example, an audio or an, an video conference uh, with the inspection panel for issues uh, related to the uh, in investigation reports. Uh, the third area is about verification of the management action plans. Uh, you know that the management does action plans uh, after an investigation has been uh, finalized and explains in those action plans how they want to deal with uh, the, the problems uh, which uh, arose. And um, from now on, there will be a, an independent verification of these uh, actions. And this will be done by the in inspection panel with the help of uh, the bank's independent audit unit, which is a GIA. Uh, so they will have a function to, to verify uh, and to validate the management action plans. Um, and uh, this is a, a new approach. And uh, as I said, the objective is to improve implementation and follow up uh, of the of the management action plans. Um, this also provides, of course, an, uh, an assurance uh, to the board that management is uh, effectively uh, correcting the consequences of its own acts of non-compliance. And this also means being more responsive uh, to the concerns of project affected people. So that's the third area. The fourth one is uh, extension of the time limit uh, to present um, uh, requests. Uh, so 
the decision has been taken to extend this time limit uh, for for the presentation of requests and uh, uh, we talk about uh, 15 months after closure uh, of the project uh, this will ensure that uh, the requesters have more time of course to identify the potential harm caused by a project uh, supported um, a bank supported uh, project uh, and to voice um, concerns uh, to, to the inspection panel. Of course, it also sets out uh, the predictability of the inspection uh, panel process for the borrower and uh, for, the, for the bank. I think those four are the, perhaps the most important. Uh, there are three more very briefly. Uh, it's that, um, uh, as you know, the the bank executed trust funds. Um, they are not until now governed uh, by uh, the bank's uh, policies and procedures. And, and as a consequence, they do not fall uh, within the, the inspection panel's uh, mandate. However, uh, in the future, um, in relevant cases, the inspection panel uh, might come up uh, in um, come in uh, investigation provided that eligibility criteria are um, are met. Um, so this means uh, inspection panel competence also in uh, that area. Uh, then uh, the sixth area is uh, about advisory services function. I think Dilek, you also mentioned that already uh, in future the, the panel will have an advisory uh, function. And, we all know that the bank that the panel has enormous knowledge and expertise regarding uh, projects and uh, and also project implementation and that's a, a great uh, potential for improving uh, the effectiveness uh, of of the bank's projects and uh, to work on lessons um and in in the future uh, the inspection panel can give advice in those areas also to management and we already have seen that uh, I think one example is uh, the guidance note on gender-based uh, violence where you already advise, gave some advice if I'm well informed. The last area is co-financing again uh, um, as you know an increasing number of, uh, of projects uh, are being from the bank are being co-financed uh, by other multilateral development banks and for such cases the inspection panel uh, will uh, formalize uh, its current uh, practice uh, and um, uh, agree with uh, the accountability mechanism of the other MDB uh, to uh, coordinate uh, and, and process a complaint. So there will be more coordination because we can see that more and more projects are co-financed. So that's the last area. And I think, um, as I try to, to highlight, all these areas are, are good for project-affected uh, uh, people. Thank you, Dilek. Thank you very much, Jürgen. That was extremely useful. Indiana? Um, thank you, Dilek. Um, so good morning, everybody, and I want to make a special warm welcome to our stakeholders in Asia, the Pacific, Africa and South America. I hope that you're watching and tuning in to some of the important changes that are happening at the World Bank Inspection Panel. So, um, you know, as Jürgen rightly said, this whole reform process was driven by the need for greater accountability for project affected people. So at the end of the day, this is not about the inspection panel. It's not about management. It's not about the board, but it's about how to improve and access accountability for people like yourselves who are listening out there or the CSOs who work with them. So it's for the people who were harmed or will potentially be harmed by World Bank, by World Bank projects. So for me, one of the most important things about this reform process is that it closes the accountability loop. For example, and we'll talk about a whole range of um, reforms, but let me just focus on one clear example about how one reform will improve accountability for project-affected people. 
Jürgen mentioned that we now have a time eligibility extension up to 15 months. Now, before this, before the reforms uh, became effective, a person who was affected by a project or a community had to file a complaint to the inspection panel for the last 28 years. So this was the practice for the last 28 years um, before 95% disbursement of the project. So this was quite a strict rule and, and in a way quite insensitive to poor and marginalized people, the very, the very people who the World Bank is supposed to help. Thankfully, now we are better off because people now have 15 months in which to file a complaint, even after the project has closed. So this is a, this is a significant advancement for us. So it means that people who are struggling to find out who is funding this project, how do we find out about the project? Where do we go to on the World Bank website to find out about this highly complicated financial details? So this is a very important practical um, reform, which will be of great significance to people because now they have 15 months more within which to find out the complicated information and to file a complaint. The second thing I want to highlight, because I'll talk about sharing the report um, later, is that unlike other IAMs, we have not had a dispute resolution function. So it's really quite important to offer this option um, to the um, uh, complainants, remembering that um, complainants, if they choose dispute resolution as an option to try and resolve their, their problem with the bank, they, it's not a complete um, sacrifice of a compliance review. So you can go into a dispute resolution um, process, and if you are unhappy with the outcome or any element of the outcome, you can still come back to compliance review. So this, again, is a very important option for people who are affected by projects. Um, uh, Jürgen mentioned mon the verification, which is very similar to monitoring. Um, again, it's an example of closing the accountability loop. For the last 28 years, the inspection panel has not been able to go back to look to see what is happening with the management action plan. As some of you will know, the management action plan is the World Bank's response to the findings of the inspection panel's investigation. So we make findings about how there were policy non-compliances, and then management has to come up with a response to try and address the problem through remedial measures in the management action plan. So now we have, with the group internal audit, which is a very strategic partnership, we have a way of reporting independently to the board what is happening with the management action plan, is it being implemented properly, and so on and so forth. And um, so I think the most important thing is that after two decades, we now have these significant important reforms with which we are able to provide you, the stakeholders, with a better service in terms of accountability. Thank you, Dilek. Thank you very much, Imrana. Very important points that you raised. So, Jolie, can we hear from you next? Sure. Thank you, Dilek. Uh, and thank you so much for organizing this. It's a real privilege to be on the panel today. Um, and thank you, uh, Imrana and, and Jürgen, both for your leadership in, in accomplishing these reforms over the last few years. Um, so I just want to start out by also expressing appreciation for the, the title and the focus of the panel today. Um, communities, as, as I think both of um, my co-panelists have mentioned, um, should be at the heart of any reform effort of the panel. Uh, and any such effort should have the primary goal of enhancing the mechanism's effectiveness for those communities. Um, I should flag at the outset uh, also that I, I don't speak for communities um, myself here today, uh, but based on my experience and that of my organizations over the last few decades working with the panel, uh, I can offer a sense of what this process and its outcome might mean for those that may go through the panel process in the future. Um, I'm also going to just focus my initial comments on um, three of the reforms that were mentioned, um, dispute resolution, verification, and advisory. Uh, as Jürgen mentioned, all of the reforms are important and, and make a difference for communities, but I think these three um, really move the ball in terms of facilitating remedy, which is the primary goal that most communities have in, in engaging in this process, but I'll speak to some of the others later. 
Um, so I'll start first with uh, what the panel itself means for communities. Um, I think it's important to, to start there. Uh, so as others have, have already mentioned a little bit about the history of the panel, um, it was created as a way for the communities to hold the bank accountable uh, when it violated its own policies um, that were meant to protect them and their environment. Uh, it was groundbreaking at the time the panel was established uh, because it was the first mechanism that really operationalized this idea of accountability. Um, that ordinary citizens could hold powerful institutions accountable to their policies and procedures. Um, this means so much to communities who have often gone through a lot of trauma and hardship before ever getting to the panel. And often the panel is the first authoritative entity uh, that doesn't ignore or diminish their concerns. So this dynamic should um, be remembered and, and definitely should inform any reform effort uh, uh, that's undertaken. So what did the toolkit reform process uh, mean for communities? Uh, the purpose, as, as others have mentioned, for the reform uh, effort was to update the panel's toolkit. And this really happened in light of the adoption of new environmental and social policies uh, by the bank, uh, called the Environmental and Social Framework now. Uh, the ESF represented a real paradigm shift for the bank from the traditional rules-based system of the safeguards uh, to a structure that invited much more discretion and flexibility for management. Uh, so at the time, uh, for many in civil society that had gone through that environmental and social framework review, the toolkit reform presented an opportunity to modernize the panel uh, toolkit in a way that would better serve affected communities under this new system. And uh, that was primarily the goal there um, was organized around sort of three, three ways of updating this. First, by bringing the panel in line with best practice that had evolved at other institutions by providing additional paths to remedy for communities and instituting new modes for institutional learning. So that was sort of the expectation. Those three expectations were what uh, civil society held for the review. Uh, unfortunately, the process did, was not, uh, or did not rather include communities or civil society uh, in, a, in a meaningful way uh, throughout. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but uh, ultimately, uh, the reforms that were adopted, uh, what did they mean for communities? On its face, I do think the reform package does seem overly accommodating to management in many ways um, and doesn't necessarily prioritize uh, community access over, over those um, accommodations to management. It also could unnecessarily circumscribe the panel's discretion over how to implement these new tools, which is, of course, ironic given the uh, discretion afforded to management under the new environmental and social framework. However, overall, I think that the reforms taken together accomplish most of, of what the review set out to do for the following reasons. Uh, as, my, as other panelists have mentioned here, um, the addition of dispute resolution, verification, and advisory means that the panel is much more in line with best practices that have been established at other institutions. I also think that there is a greater likelihood that the panel process will result in real remedy for requesters, either through dispute resolution or through compliance with the addition of verification. Uh, and I also think that in addition to the advisory function, which is meant to capture lessons learned uh, by the panel itself, that the involvement of group internal audit in the verification process will hopefully help to facilitate learning across the institution to benefit future project affected communities. I'm optimistic about these reforms, uh, but I do hope that the board does take the opportunity to review the implementation of them very seriously in three years' time, which was a commitment uh, made at the time of their adoption. I also hope that the process for, for the review of, of these reforms at that, at that time uh, is inclusive and participatory, and then it evaluates how the system as a whole is serving communities before confirming that this is, in fact, the best structure and set of functions um, for the World Bank's accountability framework. Uh, so I'll stop there, but excited to drill down uh, in the Q&A on some of these issues further. Thank you so much, um, Jolie. We will point to some of the issues that you mentioned regarding the process and the CSO engagement and the community's engagement in the specific questions. So let's uh, come to the specific questions now. And the first question is uh, to Jorgen. So Jorgen, as you also mentioned, the boards uh, focused on specific issues when reviewing the panel's toolkit. Can you tell us why did the board focus on these areas only? And was there a discussion on a broader review? Uh, that's a good question. 
uh, it's, it's links to some history. Uh, it started, in fact, before I took up this um, responsibility as uh, Cody uh, chair. Um, and uh, perhaps uh, one important point in time was uh, 2015, where the panel uh, commissioned a comparative analysis uh, of accountability mechanisms of international uh, institutions. And uh, at that time, the panel identified um, a few areas where other accountability mechanisms were in a way more advanced. They had something the back panel uh, did not have. And um, then uh, you uh, remember we have uh, agreed on uh, the new World Bank environmental and uh, social uh, framework in 2016. Uh, Jolie has uh, mentioned uh, that. And uh, there, Cody began a discussion on how to move forward uh, on the modernization of the inspection panel's uh, toolkit. And the comparative uh, analysis was still in, in the minds uh, of uh, the, the people. Um, and uh, then in the following, uh, after 2016, uh, Cody worked with the panel uh, to identify areas uh, that uh, could enhance its effectiveness um, and uh, also being careful that uh, a term which often has been used not to fix what wasn't broken. So there was a process, what are the areas and based uh, on, on, on these discussions then and also feedback uh, received from external stakeholders um, this was around August 2017. The board then um, uh, approved a, a, a kind of qualitative uh, assessment of the benefits and also the disadvantages uh, of um, uh, possible reforms uh, in, uh, in a number of areas. And these were seven, and these were exactly the seven, the seven we were then taking up and following up uh, in particular it's two exercises in, in with a two-step approach. Thank you very much, uh, Jürgen. So my next question is for Imrana. So Imrana, uh, as you know, the board authorized the sharing of the panel's investigation report with requesters in October 2018. The tool has been used three times now in cases in Uganda, <laughs> India, and Brazil. Can you talk a little about the experience and the reaction of the affected communities uh, of having the panel's investigation report shared with them? Thank you. Thank you, Dilek. Yes, so um, the sharing of the report might not sound like an important accountability tool because out of context it's probably meaningless to a lot of people because one would assume that when a report is drafted it's published and made available to everybody. That's not actually how it works. So up until now the panel was only able to share with the complainants the contents outline of the report until it was approved by the board and until the management action plan was approved by the board. So just to explain for those of you out there who may not be so familiar with our process, the inspection panel makes the findings. It delivers the report to the board. Then management has to develop a management action plan, which is the remedial measures to address the non policy non-compliances that the panel found. So up until now, the panel was not able to go back to the requester's complainants and say, here, read the report. You need to read this report because if you read it, you will be able to make meaningful inputs when management consults you about what is in the management action, action plan. So you can see that it doesn't sound very meaningful, but it actually is a very, very important tool because by doing this, the requesters can, during the consultation process on the management action plan, 
the um, complainants can hear what the management has to say and then respond and say, we, you know, we think that this particular remedial measure could work more effectively by doing A, B, and C. So um, we've done this three times now, once in India, Brazil, and Uganda. Now, I was personally involved with the Indian experience, so I will share that with you. And it was a very, very important um, tool. The uh, complainants in the Indian experience were tribal leaders. And so we went to their area from where they came from and went through the report with them. Now, our reports are, are, are quite complicated. They have to be that way because they have to be rigorous and stand up to scrutiny because sometimes they're written in a legalistic way because they need to be that way. So what we did was we went through the report, all the major findings, and said to them, this is what the inspection panel said. So in some cases, we had found that the bank was not in compliance, what was in compliance with policy, uh, policies of the bank. So, you know, um, that might be disappointing to the complainants, but nevertheless, we went through all, all of the policy compliances and non-compliances in great detail and explained to them in very simple language what that meant. And we also had a translator, interpreter, who was able to translate what we were saying not only in Hindi, but also in the indigenous language of the people. So these were indigenous people. Now, I just want to share a very, very important um, anecdote because it explains very clearly what this means to the requesters. Some of the requesters, when we went through this experience with them, were deeply emotional. <clears throat> they said that it was the first time that important people, that how, that's how they describe it, important people from the bank, had sat across the table from them as equals and treated them with respect and listened to them. So they felt that the sharing of the report at such an early stage before the management action plan was shared with them was a deeply empowering and empowering experience for them. Um, and it was, they felt that they had been respected and heard. So one should never, um, discount the importance of the symbolism, symbolism of, of this process. So not only is it important because it's strategic and it enables them to make meaningful inputs into the management action plan, but it's important symbolism because it's showing that the bank has heard what has happened to them, that the bank cares about what happens to them through the inspection panel sharing of the report process. Thank you, Dilek. Thank you very much, Imrana. It's very interesting. Um, so the next question is to for Jolie. So Jolie, you talked about the process. And um, so after going through the panel process on also you have experienced uh, other um, independent accountability mechanism review process. So in your view, how can these review processes be improved going forward um, as uh, different independent accountability mechanisms uh, undergo these kind of reviews? Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Dilek. Um, so uh, as with many uh, reform processes at, at all of the institutions, there are always a few uh, weaknesses with the process. Uh, I'll just touch on a few. Um, the first was this review, I think, as, as Jurgen um, mentioned earlier, uh, it was initially very limited in scope. Um, it did not include a systems level analysis of the broader accountability framework uh, to identify gaps, um, to figure out how to address those in order to better serve communities. Um, and, you know, and this is the type of analysis that, that does take place and has taken place at other institutions, most recently at the, the IFC and the African Development Bank prior to a, to a review like this. Um, nevertheless, it evolved into a much broader overhaul of the panel structure, despite being very limited initially in scope. And the creation of a new AM, uh, which was designed without the benefit of that systems level analysis, uh, I worry that this will lead to potentially to problems down the road. And I think that the model that other institutions have, have used, as I mentioned, um, should be the default going forward. Uh, the other issue, as I've already touched on, is that neither civil society nor communities who had been through this process um, had the opportunity to consult on either a draft of the analysis 
um, and, and the findings that went into the review or the policy proposals that revolted, resulted rather from, from that review. Um, this has become standard practice at other institutions and I, I think it leads to better recommendations um, as well as policy proposals. Uh, we all know that the devil is in the details on these policies and having more input from, from people with experience in these processes can ensure that, that gaps are filled and that mistakes are not missed in the process. Um, also, from the outside, uh, uh, this process seemed overly political. Um, there seemed to be, you know, very few uh, internal champions for the uh, representing the interests of, of communities um, or for strengthening, you know, the independence of these processes. Um, and I think, you know, rather, again, from the outside, uh, the process seemed to compromise on what was best for communities in favor of what management might be able to live with. Um, so in the future, I do hope that senior leadership at the institution uh, can set a, a, a better tone around the importance of, of communities in these processes um, and can send a much clearer message about the importance of really strengthening uh, the panel process and, and the, the accountability mechanism as a whole um, now um, as something that really promotes the success of the institution as a whole. Um, so I think, uh, you know, in general, this is this was a disappointing process, and, and I think a lot could be improved. Um, and, and I hope it is in, in, in the forthcoming review of the, of the of the reforms. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jolie. So um, I will turn back again to Jorgen. And um, so the question now is on the creation of the new accountability mechanism. So the inspection panel has been around for more than a quarter century. So why was the decision made to create a new accountability mechanism housing both the panel and a dispute resolution service as opposed to just putting the dispute resolution under the panel. So if you can clarify that, Jorgen, thank you. Uh, shall I also directly say a few words on uh, the, the question Julie raised? That would be great. Sure. Thank you, Jorgen. You're mute, Jorgen. Excuse me. It's too early in the morning. Um, yes, Julie said uh, that um, uh, the process uh, was uh, a kind of light one and not a so systematic one with a comprehensive analysis at the at the beginning, and then uh, a kind of uh, a consistent, consequent uh, discussion on different issues, and then following uh, then with implementation issues. Uh, I think that's right, um, and it's different than what we are doing with regard to the CAO reform. That's what you have said. Um, I, I, I don't know. Um, I came into the process in the midst, uh, and uh, we we had the task to do something, uh, to agree on reforms. And of course, uh, as we didn't have this systematic analysis, um, things played out very differently. But and. Perhaps you are right uh, that uh, this came with downsides, but it also came with upsides. Uh, the upside was that everybody had to go into it, as we do not didn't have this uh, kind of uh, scientific basis. We had to gather the information, and we sat together with. I think I did some 100 to 130 meetings altogether uh, to get the information, to get the sense and the perspective of the different. Um, of the different uh, stakeholders and to understand things. And the whole CODI, uh, the whole committee, they are all not experts, that they had to go into the issues. And then we came up with options and possible solutions. So there was a high degree of ownership and this led to a result. And that's what you said, that uh, the reform is quite comprehensive. If we had done the other way, I think, you know, um, the discussion would have been perhaps flatter and perhaps not uh, uh, played out in, in that way. So there are risks. Um, um, there are risks. There are still open questions, uh, but we also agreed to have a review. And that's why we, we have uh, decided to do so in three years time. And then we can always uh, improve on that. But your question, uh, Dilek, uh, the new uh, mechanism, why? Uh, such a new uh, comprehensive mechanism. Uh, you know, the panel has been set up as a 
with a kind of compliance uh, function. And, and uh, we decided to add a, a dispute resolution function. And some argued uh, that uh, the bank um, uh, management's uh, GRS, Grievance Redress Service, uh, was working well and there was no need to establish uh, an independent dispute resolution. There was resistance by some, uh, but uh, some liked the idea, but um, still uh, there was discussion how to do that. Uh, for example, um, some said that the dispute resolution uh, should be carried out uh, by a government supported uh, body with capacity to deal with deep rooted uh, socio-cultural uh, uh, complexities that require local solutions. So this was one argument. And again, even those who wanted to have this dispute resolution uh, function, independent from management, cautioned uh, that uh, the, there might be a conflict uh, of interests and um, uh, there might be a, a problem giving to the panel uh, the second function uh, because conflicting uh, responsibilities. And uh, then we heard uh, very loud, loudly and clearly, including uh, from many of you there, uh, that enabling the, the panel to offer dispute res resolution could uh, strip the panel of its impartiality and transparency and that the dispute resolution required uh, people with specialized skill sets that the panel did not really have. So the board uh, generally agreed uh, of the, the benefit of providing this additional uh, function. Uh, however, there were different uh, views on how to do that. And we assessed the different models, also looking at other uh, MDBs and, and IFIs and I, IAMs. And uh, then we, we, we found that solution, which looks a little bit complicated, but it takes into account the concerns I just, uh, I just uh, outlined. For example, the conflict of interest uh, concern. We couldn't just move an additional dispute re resolution function under the inspection panel because of those issues, conflict of interest. Therefore, we had to create a new structure. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jürgen. This has been a very good you know, explanations, which leads me to my question to Imrana. So uh, because of this conflict uh, of interest concerns, um, there, uh, you know, there is a firewall between, established between the panel and the dispute resolution that will be um, within the accountability mechanism. So, of course, the implementation uh, of um, the dispute resolution has not yet started, but how do you foresee that, that um, this firewall will work between the panel and the dispute resolution? How do you envisage that? Thanks, Dilek. Yes, that's a very important question. The way I see it um, is that the um, it is a collaboration and a partnership between the dispute resolution side of the accountability mechanism and the inspection panel side of the accountability mechanism. Um, it, it's collaboration, I, I feel, and of course we will develop these practices over time and we will probably make a number of mistakes in the beginning, but we will learn as we go. So the firewall will exist to protect the integrity of the process. It prevents conflict of interest and a free exchange of information without prejudice. So what I mean by this is that there has to be a firewall so that when the borrower or the project implementation people and the complainant requesters sit around the dispute resolution table, they are able to speak frankly about what they think without there being any risk of that information that was exchanged at the dispute resolution mediation table to come to the compliance review part of the process and for it to affect our judgment and our findings. So the prime purpose is to prevent conflict of interest and to enable the parties to have a really good discussion about the way forward. 
And of course, the parties should be able to say anything they wish to without fearing that the information will be used against them in the compliance review, whether that's the borrower or the requester. So um, I see it as the partnership between the units as being one of collaboration and partnership, except that there will be this very clear firewall to protect the integrity of both processes. Having said that, I do not see any reason why, for example, to save the time of the requesters and to save the time of the borrower and project people, why we should not be able to do initial eligibility and assessment missions together so that the questions are asked, the meetings are done, even if those meetings are sometimes split into two. So I think that we can work these things out. You know, another dozen or plus mechanisms seem to be doing this very effectively, and there's no reason why the new World Bank accountability mechanism cannot also do the same. Thanks, Dilek. Thank you so much, Imrana. So, Joey, I want to turn uh, my question to you on the verification. So, so as you know, and as we discussed, the panel now has the ability with board approval to verify the implementation of management action plans in some cases. So do you see this as an you know, important improvement in the bank's accountability process? Yes, um, I'll say more, but yes. Uh, so in the past, uh, the panel's inability to monitor the implementation of management action plans often left communities with a little more than a great report at the end of, of a process that validated many of their concerns. Um, often it took sustained, uh, intense outside scrutiny to ensure that management action plans were properly uh, implemented. Um, with this new verification authority, even in cases where um, the public scrutiny is not as intense, uh, the panel can help to ensure that um, management remedies the harm to communities and brings projects back into compliance. Um, independent verification uh, also, I think, gives communities a voice uh, in that process. Uh, rather than just taking management's reporting of the action plan, um, rather than the board just taking uh, management's reporting of the action plan at face value. Um, I would say one caveat to, to this is that there's a lot of confusing criteria for how verification will happen in, in the updated resolution that I think will be confusing for requesters and understanding exactly why the, the type of verification is carried out in their cases versus as versus another. Um, so I think that will be confusing um, for them. But uh, otherwise, uh, yes, I think this is a really important um, new function for the panel. Thank you very much, uh, Jolie. So my last set of question is uh, the same for all of you. And, um, you know, we want to talk about a little bit, I want to ask you about um, what challenges do you foresee in implementing these um, important changes um, that came to the inspection panel toolkit after so many years and also in establishment of this new accountability mechanism. So why don't we start with Jorgen and then you know we'll go to Imrana and Jolie. Jorgen, thank you. Yes, um, so I think uh, one general point is, um, as uh, we already said, uh, this uh, is um, now uh, a new approach and uh, we are all quite aware that uh, many things uh, will happen down the road uh, which uh, perhaps uh, will lead us to uh, to engineer more around uh, the how we apply those uh, new uh, policies and so there will be a kind of, of learning curve and uh, that's why we already agreed uh, that uh, there will be a review in three years uh, time and this will be a moment of possible uh, course correction. Um, the, that's uh, a general remark, but uh, there are challenges. And uh, one challenge uh, is to really uh, ensure that the system does not create um, kind of disincentives uh, to pursue the dispute resolution uh, function. And uh, one issue there is um, 
the question how we will deal with uh, situations where the different parties, they sit together uh, in a dispute resolution case, and then they identify areas of um, solution and consensus, but areas, uh, other areas might not be solved. So how do we deal with those uh, cases? Uh, and this is linked to the incentive issue. So that's something we have to look at uh, down the road and also see how it plays out in, in specific cases. Perhaps it will not become relevant, perhaps yes. Uh, then an, another area um, of, of challenge is the, the supervision uh, of project once uh, the project has closed. Um, I think that's clear. Um, then the bank uh, doesn't have any responsibility or not so much and um, structures are dissolved. Uh, and uh, if there are still problems, I think uh, then that's a, a challenge uh, we, we are facing. Um, and uh, a third area I would say is uh, the risk uh, that um, the whole verification uh, process uh, gets a little bit politicized. Um, and I think it, it's really, it needs a sense of cooperation by all parties uh, to implement this complicated, as uh, Jolie said, um, verification uh, process in a sensible way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jürgen. You pointed out two important challenges ahead of us. Uh, so, Imrana, what are your views on the challenges? Well, that's a, such a broad question, isn't it? Um, you know, one, one thing I like about what's happening is that everybody is approaching this with the right spirit. And I think that that's really important, that we want this to work. We want when the accountability mechanism secretary, who is, I think, the deadline for the applications on November the 6th or 7th, when he or she is appointed, that he or she will have a holistic perspective of what accountability means so that there is no um, particular inclination towards dispute resolution or particular inclination towards compliance review, but that what is the best alternative in this particular situation with this particular requesters. So I think if that is one challenge, but I think that with good collaboration and good partnership, we can sort this out. I would not want, for example, and this is a very important thing for me, and, and I know it is for the other panel members as well, we do not want one function to deplete the other. So, for example, the availability of dispute resolution should not mean that compliance review dies, if you like, as, happened, as has happened elsewhere. So, because we know, for example, that the institution, the international financial institutions, learn more from compliance than they do from dispute resolution. So that's one challenge. The second challenge is how do we, one of our continuing obstacles is how do we make the communities aware that there is an accountability process? This is a, a very difficult thing. So sometimes we talk to people who say, oh gosh, we wish we'd known you existed. We could have done this, so we could have done that. So I think that there has to be a concerted effort made on the part of project teams when they're doing their due diligence, when they're doing their consultation, to make sure that the communities who are affected by the project, or could be affected by the project, know that we exist. They know that there's a grievance redress service. They know, they know that there's a grievance uh, uh, mechanism at project level, and they can access the panel if they're not satisfied with the responses of the grievance redress service or the project mechanism. So those are uh, uh, two of the many challenges that I see going forward. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Dilek. Thank you very much, Imrana. Jolie. Thank you. Um, I, I, well, I, I couldn't agree more with Imrana. Uh, I think we all agree that we want this new system to work. Um, and, and I agree that you know people are, are really trying to approach this in, in the right spirit. Um, I'll just focus on a couple of challenges I see. I think, you know, again, highlighting um, uh, community concerns around potentially these new functions. Um, 
But as I mentioned before, with respect to um, another question, I, I do think that some of these new functions are potentially unnecessarily confusing and even pose barriers uh, to access for communities that do have genuine concerns. Um, so the first uh, issue here is, is on dispute resolution and the fact that communities have to go through the compliance eligibility process to get there. Um, I, I think that you know, for communities that have concerns about a project, uh, why do they have to meet the eligibility criteria for compliance if they might never go through a compliance process? Um, and if both the communities and the borrower uh, are willing to use the accountability mechanisms dispute resolution service, uh, why not offer that uh, as, as, a, as a service um, to them? So I think that's, that's a, a, going to be a, a challenge, I think, um, going forward to explain that. Uh, and, and also for communities to really understand, um, you know, that, that, that an option could be, you know, closed off for them, uh, even when it could be helpful. Uh, so I think uh, the other issue um, that I think will be very confusing, and Imrana talked about this a little bit earlier, uh, the change for the, the time limit for eligibility is definitely a positive one. I agree. It's much more clear. Um, but there will now be two different rules for the timeline for eligibility based on when a project is approved. Uh, for projects approved before the date of the resolution, the old rule that Imrana referred to before is maintained, um, which was a was confusing criteria uh, for, for communities trying to figure out, you know, when that 95% disbursement uh, level was reached, um, and it posed, it posed challenges for communities to, to obtain that information. Um, in addition, now before they even file a complaint, they will need to contend with this additional layer of complexity uh, to figure out which rule uh, applies. Uh, any barriers like this, I think, to, to eligibility should have been much more carefully thought through, um, and the reform should have really been made retroactive uh, for all future complaints, uh, in my opinion. And I think that will pose a challenge, again, for communities to really understand if they brought a, a grievance and it would fit under the new system, why can't they file their complaint? I think that will be re really challenging for communities to understand. Um, overall, uh, you know, I think as I've, I've alluded to, I, I think it's unfortunate that there isn't um, a greater lack of discretion afforded to the panel to, to carry out these reforms. Jurgen mentioned there's, there's going to be a, a learning curve here. Um, I, I think that's right, uh, but I think it would have been better to not circumscribe um, the panel's ability to really work through and, and identify the best way to implement these reforms, um, and, and they should have been given more freedom, uh, the, the ability to do that. Uh, I think going forward, especially around verification, as I've mentioned before, I think the criteria there, um, you, you know, are, are probably overly, um, uh, it's overly circumscribed uh, going forward. But, um, but again, I, you know, agree that verification doesn't necessarily always need a one-size-fits-all approach, but I think it should have been up to the panel working with communities to really figure that out. Um, so thanks. Stop there. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, Jolie. So we are now uh, re um, turning to the questions coming from the audience as we uh, screen these questions. Um, so there was a, a question regarding the effectiveness of different um, uh, tools. Uh, let me just point out on those, you know, effectiveness dates. Uh, so. For the sharing of the report, the investigation report with the communities and the, ma the mandate, uh, additional mandate to the panel on the advisory uh, services became effective in October 2018. But the rest of the tools regarding the dispute resolution, time eligibility, verification, um, is effective became effective September 8, but of course uh, we will need the positions to be filled uh, for the operationalization of the accountability mechanism and the dispute resolution service, which ties me to the next question that was posed: is how this uh, you know Imrana mentioned the November 6 deadline for the selection of the or the application of the accountability mechanism secretary but Jürgen can you tell us a little bit about you know what is going to be the process for the accountability mechanism secretary selection who's going to select that and um, uh, and how do you foresee the process moving forward thank you yes uh Thanks to you. Uh, um, so we started the process 
and uh, as usually uh, you establish a, a, a committee, a selection committee. We have established the selection committee um, and they're very much uh, looking at the way we do, uh, for example, for the, for the selection of the inspection panel uh, chair, but also looking at other accountability and independent um, uh, entities uh, in, in the World Bank, like, for example, the director of the independent evaluation group. So we established that, um, that selection panel. Uh, we established the rules, how this panel uh, will work. Uh, and uh, as a first step, uh, we discussed issues like uh, uh, the publication of the job, the terms of reference, uh, and how, how we will, uh, uh, you know, describe uh, the, the job and the job qualification in those uh, publications. And uh, then uh, we uh, will probably work with um, a kind of uh, search firm, Headhunter, and uh, there we um, uh, we uh, um, the first step will be to uh, after publication uh, to uh, set up a, a list uh, a long list and then a short list. So we have discussed uh, all that, and uh, as uh, you uh, and uh, Imrana already said. Uh, this will be done in the next uh, in the next weeks. Uh, the process should come to an end in the next weeks with the selection of uh, the new person um, in November. Thank you very much. Uh, so another question. Um, uh, I'll pose this question to Imrana. Uh, you know, regarding the affected communities. Um, how they are being made aware of how to access the dispute resolution function and about the inspection panel process. So what are, I mean, you know how to um, explain, of course, um, uh, about the inspection panel process, but how do you envisage that with dispute, res uh, dispute resolution function? Yes, um, <clears throat> I think I mentioned earlier on how challenging it is to get communities aware that we exist and that they have access to us for accountability. Now, in the resolution of the inspection panel, um, also, um, uh, you know, it's an it's a, it's a, um, obligation on the part of the bank to make communities aware that we exist. So um, there's several ways of doing this. One way of doing this is I mentioned before that project teams, when they are doing the consultation process at the due diligence or design stage of a project, that they should let people know that we exist. Obviously, the new accountability mechanism is going to have to do new forms of outreach, new forms of seminar to get that information out to the people. This is why I mentioned it as one of the really difficult continuing challenges. And of course, we rely a lot on our stakeholders out there, including the CSOs and NGOs who are, who are active in the environmental and social um, uh, safeguards community to please make an effort to make sure that people know that we exist. But um, yes, it's a continuing challenge and one that we're gonna have to work on together with a new dispute resolution unit. Thank you very much, Imrana. So uh, we know Jorgen has to leave um, a little bit earlier than the session at 8.40 because, you know, we, we are really thankful for his participation in this extremely busy time, annual meetings and the meetings are still going on. So um, before you leave, uh, Jorgen, if I may ask, because um, the board discussion, the reform process also brought some changes to the institution in support of the accountability process uh, or in the overall um, bank. So, I mean, there are certain things that management needed, needs to also improve in, in these reforms. Can you tell us a little bit before you leave very quickly and then um, we'll let you go. Uh, Dilek, could you could you specify the the question? Uh, so, 
the question is about uh, how the management uh, has to exactly uh, yeah. you know the management actions and how management also needs to improve some of its processes to uh, to improve the accountability together with the panel reforms yes uh, okay um, yes uh, that's uh, that's of course a very important point um, and uh, which also shows that we we really looked at that um, challenge to improve what can be done for uh, the uh, communities and affected people in a very comprehensive way we we did not only look at the inspection panel but also for example what the the management can do and there are a number of issues but perhaps uh, just uh, to uh, to highlight a very important one and this is a lot around this uh, GRF, the Grievance Redress uh, Service. Um, there, uh, we had the impression that this service already works quite well. It has been introduced a few years ago, and uh, this made uh, the bank much more responsive to problems uh, arising in such a context and uh, to try to improve the situation very early on. Uh, and this is, for example, different uh, than what we have seen on the IFC side. There they, we have the impression that sometimes things uh, dragged on and there was a lack of responsiveness. There, the GRS is uh, a mechanism which uh, should be responsive and improves responsiveness early on to avoid problems because the communities are better served to avoid problems than to help once uh, the problems arise. So uh, there we improved that service. In particular, we made it also more independent uh, because uh, now we have uh, an escalation clauses with uh, the upper management much more involved in, in this uh, service. Uh, there are other issues, but perhaps, you know, uh, to, to, to use the time I, I have, I would like to, uh, to say, um, uh, one one other word, uh, and it's uh, uh, in in a way uh, for me a sad moment because uh, uh, I, as you might know, I will be it, this will be the end of my term. Uh, I only have one week left, uh, and then I will go back to uh, to the German government, where will I will have a responsibility for the World Bank and for other international institutions. So I I will still follow. Uh, what you will do and uh, how the reforms will be uh, implemented. But I really have to say that it has been one of my uh, my most um, important uh, and marking um, uh, experiences to work with you all on those reforms. Very tiring, uh, you know, very intensive. Uh, and sometimes we had very difficult situations sitting at that time. We were still were physically sitting together uh, on the half of the night, uh, heated debates, uh, which uh, uh, in a way brought us closer together, I think. And it was uh, uh, sometimes, uh, if it's true that um, uh, the quality of an outcome also depends on, on, on the uh, the extent of uh, energy and suffering which went into it, I think the quality must be great. Um, but uh, I will continue to, to follow this and I would like to thank everybody who participated in that exercise. And many out there now participating in that event, I think they gave inputs into that uh, process. It has been a great experience. We are not there, of course. We, it still needs um, investment from all of us, uh, but uh, I think it, it's, it's a good basis and I'm quite satisfied uh, with what we have uh, achieved. Thanks to all. Jürgen, thank you so much. And you know, your leadership was tremendous and uh, very impactful on this process. And uh, with your calm manner, you were able to, you know, <laughs> went through many, many tough discussions, and uh, but you maneuvered it very, very ably. And we really thank you and appreciate your leadership uh, uh, on this as the chair of the CODI. Um, I'm sure that you didn't have uh, anticipated this when you were. <laughs> 
taking this job and uh, but uh, we truly appreciate all your efforts because these are extremely important measures uh, for the panel to become more effective and and to be able to help the communities better and also to institution to learn uh, we believe that uh, all of them we made progress and and we can you know the inspection panel take this further uh, for for the overall accountability of the world bank thank you so much and best wishes best luck uh, in your next uh, government uh, of course in the german government and we will miss you very much thank you jorgen thanks a lot to to you all bye bye So I'm really sorry about that. So we will continue with other questions that are coming in. And this question, I want to pose it to um, Jolie and see what your views uh, from the CSO perspective. I'm sure that you have thought about these uh, issues and uh, whether you have any, um, uh, what are your ideas, any creative ideas for the bank and for the board? Um, because the bank has its environmental and social policies and standards, and there is an, you know, a company accountability framework. So uh, for you, what improvements can the bank do to also bring the borrowing countries more closely into this accountability system and be able to have this ownership also um, in order to ensure better project outcomes. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, your views, Jolie? Uh, sure. And uh, I mentioned, I think, one um, one potentially missed opportunity here with this review, which was around dispute resolution. I think, uh, you know, offering a more um, liberal criteria for dispute resolution or, or just less criteria to get there, I think could have been really helpful to provide an, an impartial space, uh, you know, for communities and the borrower to together, um, you know, come to an agreement uh, that suits, you know, all sides, I, I think is, is potentially going to be a missed opportunity here. And I hope that we can review that in, in three years time, whether uh, you know, it is necessary to meet um, the the criteria for eligibility for compliance. So I would say that's that's one idea is to make that a little bit more open and available and allow uh, you know that that communication to ha happen directly between borrowers um, and and communities and, and facilitate that. Uh, I think you know the other um, uh, you know aspect I think of this is to provide communities more opportunities to take a leading role here. I, I, I think that sometimes the, the process becomes very adversarial, uh, you know, between um, the, the community and, and the government, uh, the borrower rather, um, in these processes. And I think providing communities uh, more of a platform to engage constructively, um, you know, directly with the borrower could be helpful. Dispute resolution is one way, but, um, you know, there's other ways I think that verification could be thought through a little bit more creatively. Um, you know, possibly giving communities the opportunity to um, do some community-based monitoring of, of the action plan, incorporating that perhaps into a verification plan, I, I think could be interesting and, and might facilitate, again, that direct communication between the communities and the borrower rather than having it channeled through through sometimes a more adversarial process. Um, so those those would be would be two ideas I have. And then I, I think always, you know, being very careful and to remind um, ourselves and and the borrower too that the compliance process is not meant to um, uh, you know uh, attack the borrower. Uh, sometimes, obviously, in the findings there are, are things that come up that that demonstrate that the borrower you know may not have exactly lived up to, to to the expectations there. But but that the compliance process particularly is really about the bank's performance and to make sure that neither the compliance process nor what the, the action plan um, ultimately comes up with puts onerous restriction or puts, puts onerous burdens rather on the borrower to fix problems that were really the the sort the the result of the bank's um, non-compliance. So I think just making sure that we remind ourselves and, and parties involved that the compliance process especially is really about the bank, I think could be um, helpful. But those are just a few, few thoughts. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, Jolie. So my next qu next question is uh, to Imrana, and this is coming from the Executive Director of Disabled Peoples International. And um, he is asking, how is this reform going to hold the bank accountable regarding issues of equality and inclusion? Uh, thank you, Dilek. Very, very important question. So, <clears throat> the question of um, equality, inclusion and vulnerability are being addressed or has been addressed in the new, well, it's not new anymore, but it became effective in October 2018, which is the bank's environmental and social framework, and several directives and good practice notes, which are part of that whole framework and subject to it. There's a specific directive on disadvantage and vulnerable groups. Um, for the first time in the bank's history, the word discrimination is mentioned in, in, in this directive. So we now have, um, if you like, for want of a better word, a policy hook that we can use to address questions of inclusion, vulnerability and equality through the environmental framework and through these bank directives. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so the next question is to Jolie. And this is about, you know, you work with the project affected communities throughout the world through Bank Information um, Center and also with your coordination with other um, CSOs. So, um, uh, so how do you approach um, you know, the project affected communities um, that uh, are not escalating their complaints without resorting to the project re uh, relevant complaints mechanism first. So how do you, what is your advice vis-a-vis -vis the, you know, accountability mechanisms of the international financial uh, institutions and also project level? Um, uh, grievance redress mechanism. So how do you approach that? You know, what is the best way or do you recommend them to go first to the GRMs at the project level and then escalate? So how do you approach the communities? Can you tell us a little bit, Joey? Sure, thanks. Um, and I, I'll start by saying that a lot of times, by the time a community comes to us for assistance or advice that they've tried a lot of these things already. They've, they've you know, tried to use a project level grievance mechanism. They've tried to get in touch with uh, project teams um, or, or, or the implementing agency and, and they've, they've not been successful. Um, but for communities that, that come to us for assistance that haven't tried these things, we always recommend, I mean, regardless of the um, the eligibility criteria, uh, you know, for the mechanism to to try to engage with management first before um, engaging with with one of the mechanisms. Um, we think that can be helpful, especially on the project team level, because the project team uh, is closest to to the project. And a lot of times, task team leaders, especially at the World Bank, are very receptive to uh, communities or, or civil society approaching them and, and providing input. Because uh, as we all know, that input can make projects better. And task teams do, uh, at least in the moment, want you know want to make sure that their projects are successful. So so we do usually advise that. Um, and then, uh, you know, we have we have advised going through some of the other uh, mechanisms. Um, but I will say that I think the you know the management led mechanisms um, just in general pose uh, pose issues sometimes for communities that may already have a lack of trust in the institution. And so um, it is important to be you know very careful about recommending uh, paths for communities that could put them at risk. Um, that might make them uncomfortable or that they feel like is, is a waste of their time. And so the, uh, the receptiveness and the ability and the accessibility, um, for lack of a better word, uh, of the panel is, is incredibly important and I think very appreciated. Um, so we do, again, try to engage first uh, with management and advise that, but um, at that point, you know, we, we do encourage also engagement, uh, you know, with the independent mechanisms as well. Uh, to find out um, if, if if it is an appropriate path for them for them to take, so we do advise on on sort of all options. Uh, but I will say that in in my experience, that the independent mechanisms are usually more attractive to communities, especially as I said, those that have already been rebuffed or or feel like their concerns have been ignored. 
Thank you very much, Jolie. It was very important for us to hear this from you. So the next question is about um, Team Rana, about frivolous complaints. And it says that by some politically motivated individuals encourage people uh, to complain, how does inspection panel take care of this? Thank you, Dilek. Um, in fact, there were a lot of questions related to admissibility, like four or five. So I'm going to deal with them in a group right here, right now. And just before I start to the audience out there, even though the seminar officially finishes at nine o'clock, if you wish to stay on until 9.30, we are able to, because we have so many questions to, that, that have been fielded to us. We're happy to stay on. Hopefully Jolie can stay on, but if she can't, that's fine. So we will try to answer your questions. As long as the audience remains above 100, we can justify it. Thank you, Dilek. Okay, so there were four or five questions related to what is the criteria for the panel to be able to handle a complaint? So first of all, let me handle the frivolous, the frivolous part. Our admissibility, our admissibility criteria explicitly says that we cannot handle um, complaints that are frivolous or, or, or um, I can't think of the other word now, frivolous or not important and so on. There has to be a plausible link between the complaint and the project. Now, of course, there has to be a 15 month time limit. So you have to make your complaint within 15 months after project closure. The complaint cannot be about fraud or procurement. So if you have a complaint about corruption, you don't come to the inspection panel, you go to the integrity vice presidency to file your complaint there. There was also a question of how do you know whether somebody has gone to the bank or to the grievance redress mechanism at project level before they come to us? Well, that is also part of our criteria. So you have to have tried in some way to have your matter resolved, either by the grievance redress service, the project grievance mechanism, management, the country office, and so on. So um, you have to have made some sort of attempt. And remember, even if you get a response and you're not satisfied, you can still come to the panel. And now, of course, you can have your matter resolved by dispute resolution as well as by compliance review. Um, uh, of course, we, we also have to ensure that um, the project is one that is actually funded by the bank, why either wholly or partially, because we often get complaints about projects that are not connected to us and they financed by another development uh, international financial institution. So those are the criteria, and I hope I've answered those four or five questions. Thank you, Dilek. That's great. Thank you so much, um, uh, Imrana. So, um, Jolie, my next question is on the reprisals. Um, as uh, you have been uh, also following up as Bank Information Center, this is an uh, issue that has been highlighted over the past couple of years regarding the you know, project affected communities when they bring their complaints to accountability systems and to the international level, there might be, uh, they might face certain reprisals. Can you tell us a little bit about this and also give us, um, you know, what, uh, what is your sense of the international accountability mechanism, including the inspection panel? What is, are you satisfied with, you know, how, the um, inspection panel and other accountability mechanisms are approaching this. And uh, of course, there's a lot of things that uh, can be done more, but um, just to give your ideas about the reprisals issue, there was a question on that. Sure. Um, so I should say at the start, you know, reprisals uh, definitely appreciate that the institutions and the mechanisms are, are taking this issue more seriously, but it's really been in recent years that there's been a recognition um, that this is a real problem. Uh, obviously, we know that uh, civic space is closing in many places or already very restricted. Um, and the problem is getting worse. So we definitely appreciate that the institutions and the mechanisms are, are taking this more into account in developing policies or commitments around this. So um, I, I think, as you said, there's there's more to be done here, but I, but I think it's a good first step. 
Um, you know, I think it's so important to think about why reprisals happen, why they're tolerated, um, and the, the contextual uh, situation that, that communities face uh, when, they, when they come to the panel. Many times speaking out about a project uh, is immediately labeled, uh, communities are labeled anti-development. They're labeled that way by, by sometimes the clients of the institutions. Um, they claim that the communities are, are against the project, trying to stop the project. Oftentimes, that's not the case. Uh, certainly, some communities deeply disagree with the project on principle. But sometimes the communities uh, just want the project to be improved, or they want their, their voices heard, or they, they want to make sure that their concerns are, are taken into consideration. And, and unfortunately, um, there does seem to be often a knee-jerk reaction to label these communities just uh, uh, writ large as anti-development or, or anti this project. And sometimes that's, that's where the, the reprisal situation becomes exacerbated by the bank's involvement in these projects um, because it's not made clear to the client that this that type of, of um, labeling is not tolerated, that the bank, um, you know, the bank I, I think should put out there much clearer messages uh, about the importance of hearing from communities and that sometimes communities will express concerns or disagreements with the project and how it's being designed or implemented and that that should inform the way that the project moves forward and they shouldn't be demonized or, or labeled as anti-development. So I think while they have you know, good commitments on paper, I think the banks generally, the institutions should be better about m making it very clear uh, that this type of engagement and disagreements are okay and, and should inform the process going forward. And I don't think that's being done enough. Um, I think the, the mechanisms do have good reprisal policies and I think already um, in many ways uh, take measures to make sure that people's confidentiality is maintained, um, that there's a lot of trust built into the process so that uh, people are not put at greater risk. Although again, you know, these, these policies are new and, and so they, they could stand, uh, you know, to, to be um, uh, made more robust going forward based on lessons learned in different situations. Um, but I, I think overall that the mechanisms seem to do a, a pretty good job with this. Um, and the institutions are really the ones that need to do better uh, about making sure that there are safe spaces to complain, um, including with management, that the borrower, that there's better expectations put on the borrowers and clients uh, around this issue, I, I think, to really move it forward, um, especially given the worsening situation around civic space. I hope that answers the question. Yes, excellent, Jolie. Thank you so much. So, my next question is to Imrana, and um, this is uh, about the advisory services. So, as you know, the board has um, given this mandate, specific mandate, um, to the panel in October 2018. The panel already published, um, you know, some publications earlier um, based on Cody's request on the policies. But after the October 2018, um, have you, has the panel done advisory uh, publications or is there anything under preparation? Can you tell us about uh, how you're implementing the new mandate? Thank you, Dilek. And I'm, I'm so glad that somebody asked about the advisory services because this is a really exciting, exciting new tool for us. Uh, because it enables us to pull together in a document the lessons that have come out of the cases that we've dealt with. And so this is all part of the of how the World Bank is a learning institution, because the, this feeds into the ability of the bank to respond to new learning and new ways of doing things. So since October, the first um, advisory that we produced after the new tool was made, was given to us, was an off, uh, was a, um, an advisory on biodiversity offsets, which came out of the Uganda Kalagala um, investigations. There were a series of um, investigations and reports on the Uganda Kalagala Dam, so we were able to produce this report and to provide it to the community and to our stakeholders. Um, upcoming on the 10th of December is the launch of a advisory on gender-based violence. Some of you know that the inspection panel in 2016 and 2018 investigated two very, very important um, projects. Um, uh, one was in the Congo and one was in Uganda, where the panel found that women and girls had been, um, had been 
victims of gender-based violence. So we're producing an advisory on that. Um, be very interesting uh, advisory, we, we think, we hope, and we hope that it will be a learning tool for everybody. That will be launched on the 9th of December. I'm sorry if I said the 10th. The 9th of December in a YouTube seminar, a little bit like this. And there'll be some interesting people speaking. Um, we'll, ha we'll have Ilana Berger from the Bank Information Center. We will have um, Her Honor Michelle Bachelet, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, open the panel and launch the advisory officially. We will have um, Moses from Joy for Children Uganda. And we also hope to have, and many of you in the gender community know her, know, her, know who she is, Dubravka Simonovic, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women. We hope to have her, um, myself, and, uh, and, and a few other people speaking. So please do attend. And then next year in the pipeline, we have an advisory on retaliation and reprisals. Um, uh, from what we've looked, from what we have seen, there are allegations of retaliation and reprisals in 24% of um, panel investigations, which is quite a high figure. So uh, we will be doing one on that, another important advisory. And then going forward next year, we also hope to produce an advisory on land issues. As you can well imagine, a large number of our complaints are to do with land. And so uh, we will be producing an advisory on that. Thank you, Dilek. Excellent, thank you so much. So there is a question, there was a question on the new ESF. And let me try to very quickly uh, to respond to that important question. Um, the ESF makes reference to the use of borrower systems is the panel or compliance review body competent to review a national legal system based on the international standard, the ESF? So as you know, the panel looks at the bank management's compliance with its policies, right? So in the ESF, there is a, a, an obligation for the bank to look at the you know, national systems and assess the legal systems and their adequacy vis-a-vis -vis the uh, the standards, the environmental and safeguard framework and the standards. And if there are gaps, there is the, um, you know, additional measures um, that are um, um, put together uh, as part of the agreement with the borrower country. So what the panel looks at is whether the bank has done this due diligence, whether the bank has reviewed the legal systems and, you know, found out the gaps in the national systems and the environmental and, safe, uh, and social frameworks and whether able to identify those gaps and uh, agreed with the borrower countries to ensure their um, implementation by uh, during the project implementation. So that's what the panels uh, vis-a-vis -vis the national legal systems. And so I have a question to Jolie regarding the prevention of disputes, actually. And um, I know that um, you also, in the CSA, CSOs, uh, have stakeholder-owned early monitoring and evaluation systems to, you know, understand what are the disputes um, uh, uh, or, or issues coming out in projects and what is, you know, is there any preventive element that you, um, rather than escalating these um, these uh, complaints, which is an important part, but is there a, a, a preventive role that the CSOs play vis-a-vis uh, -vis the affected complaint com uh, communities, or you know what are, what other measures do you do you take into these situations? Thanks, Joby. Thanks. This is a really important question, uh, and and I think. The new environmental and social framework does provide, uh, you know, some early entry points now to really work on uh, concerns or potential risks 
uh, upstream, which I, I think, um, you know, my organization, my colleagues uh, agree, uh, would agree that that's, that's the best time to address some of these issues is when the project is being designed uh, and really prior to implementation to make sure that the risks are really understood. Um, not only the, the specific project uh, related risks and direct risks to communities, but also the contextual risks, you know, how this how this project could exacerbate, uh, you know, existing situations. We talked a little bit before about civic space, um, you know, really taking the risks into consideration, doing appropriate due diligence, and then providing communities an opportunity to engage, uh, to consult early uh, in the design um, uh, process. I think it's important to keep that dialogue going throughout the project cycle. Um, the new uh, environmental and social framework does provide some new entry points for that. And it also takes into account that um, different parts of the community can be differently affected. Um, Imran, I think, mentioned earlier uh, some new directives and, and other aspects of the policy um, that really do acknowledge that uh, different marginalized groups are going to experience impacts in a differentiated way and that project teams do need to take that account into account, um, incorporate that into their, their early design, and, and hopefully uh, engage with stakeholders to make sure that they're getting that right. So we do um, always try to engage at, a, at an early uh, moment. Uh, unfortunately, oftentimes, as I mentioned before, when communities come to us, the, the project is well into implementation and a lot of these issues have already been missed. But I, I do hope, uh, you know, with the new framework and, and hopefully with the advisory function that Imrana mentioned, the lessons learned from the panels that are being more institutionalized uh, from the past, will help to really um, internalize these lessons and, and make sure that that, that issues are, are not missed at, at the design phase. But, um, but we do, yes, absolutely try to engage at the earliest possible moment. Um, for us, uh, it, that moment um, is really prior to the project being approved at the bank. Uh, I mentioned before, you know, sometimes the political process at the bank can be very problematic, but sometimes uh, it can work in a community's favor. If the community is able to identify concerns prior to project uh, approval, um, then it, 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 there's an ability to, to get the more political level um, involved, especially through the board of directors, you know, to get them involved, to put pressure on management or the borrower if they're not being receptive, uh, to make sure that these changes are made, to make sure that communities have a voice in the process, that they have the information that they need to engage is also very, very important. Um, we've mentioned a couple of times the, important of the importance of accessibility in the panel process. Uh, that is important throughout the design of the project, throughout the entire project cycle, um, to make sure that information is available in languages, local languages, for communities to really be able to engage at that early stage. Uh, for them to understand uh, how the project is going to affect them. Because again, once the, the project starts to implement um, and, and further down the road, it is harder to course correct. So uh, yes, the short answer to your question is we do try to engage as early as possible. Um, we use every opportunity we can, especially as I said before, before board approval. And regardless, you know, we do try to use all the entry points that are available at, at any stage of the project to, to try and make changes as quickly as we can. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so there is a question uh, regarding the concerns of the project affected people arising because the um, borrowing um, governments um, do not um, fund or administer certain parts of the projects and um, the question is is the new mechanism able to address such failures in Rana do you can you answer that question quick because we have lots of questions coming up <laughs> yeah look I think um, I, I think it's important for people out who are listening out there to know that we do not investigate the borrowers Right, so we don't investigate the governments or the borrowers or even the state agency that implements a project. We investigate how the bank, how we, the bank management, failed to properly design and implement a project. So I think that's a very short answer. So we do not actually investigate governments or borrowers, but it is the job of the bank to supervise the project implementation unit to implement the project properly. And if they fail to do that, we then say that the bank did not 
follow its poli its own policy in implementing the project. Thanks, Dilek. Thank you so much, Imrana. So before um, we are closing, can you also, I, I think there is a, a question regarding the distribution of complaints. Can you also um, talk a little bit about the distribution of the complaints at the inspection panel? Sure, thank you, Dilek. Um, so I quickly went and had a look, to, had a look just to give you some very precise data, which, which will be in our annual report, which will be out, which is out already on the website. So um, the largest number of complaints come from South Asia at 32%. From Africa is the second group, 26%. Latin America, 21%. Europe and Central Asia, 19%. East Asia and the Pacific at 7% and the MENA region at 5%. So that's more or less the geographical distribution. And it might be interesting for you to know that we receive complaints about, of, we receive complaints roughly about 3% on 3% of projects. So at any given time, the World Bank has more or less 220 projects going at any given time. And we receive complaints about 3% of them, and we roughly investigate one third of the complaints that we actually register. So that's important for you to know. One final point is that in terms of policy distribution, the bulk of the complaints are about the environment assessment of the project, but the environmental and social impact assessment also takes into consideration social issues. So, but if you're asking about distribution that way, it's in the environment and then consultation and participation. The third largest group is resettlement. And then of course, indigenous people. But remember that very rarely do we have a complaint that is only about one issue. Usually there are multiple complaints covering a number of policy non-compliance allegations. Thanks. Excellent. So I think we are coming to the end of our session. Very interesting. Um, as a topic and you know excellent speakers before i close can, do you want to just um give us your final thoughts imrana jolie that will be very um important thank you uh Dilek, would you like to go to jolie first Sure, Julie, why don't you start with, you know, just very briefly before we close, you know, your final thoughts on the overall reforms and uh, and their impact to the communities. Sure. Um, well, we've talked a little bit about borrower, you know, the importance of borrower buy-in for the system, but I, I think it's important for, for everyone to really acknowledge how important these processes are for improving the work of the institution. Um, and, and how, you know, certainly at, for every process at the heart, the community's needs and the need to remedy the harms they've experienced should be the number one goal. Um, but the process itself should contribute to institutional learning, make uh, projects better. And I think everyone should be able to get uh, behind that idea. And I wish that was something that, um, that more people, you know, talked about and, and that there was a stronger consensus around and more support for that idea, because I, I do think that most of us believe that these processes do improve the system overall. Um, I guess I'd just leave with a, a few um, thoughts looking on, on how to implement this in the best way, uh, this new um, uh, system in the best way for communities. Um, I think number one, uh, especially with respect to dispute resolution, I know there's a lot to still be worked out there, but I do hope that um, there is an absolute commitment to follow best practice uh, with respect to dispute resolution. Um, including by consulting with the, the panel sister sister agency, the, the CAO, who, who does a, a very good job with dispute resolution, has been doing it for a long time. So I hope there's some, some collaboration there done, done at an early stage. Um, I also hope that the, the new structure uh, with the new AM secretary does not lead to any, any interference um, with the methods, decisions, operations um, of the panel itself. And I think that we're, everyone's going to need to be very vigilant to make sure that um, that those uh, dual reporting lines, uh, you know, stay in their lane and that there isn't a, a necessary tension built up there. Um, and then I would also just encourage us to think, uh, you know, in our forward-looking approach to this, 
how to make sure that the panel's independence is maintained and strengthened. Um, and especially for the board, uh, unfortunately, you're going to have to leave us, but I would really challenge the board um, as a whole to make sure that they are only getting involved uh, in the most critical areas of, of decision making and, and, and really make sure that they are also staying in their lane and not uh, unduly interfering with the, um, the, the panel's process. I would extend that uh, challenge as well to management. Um, and I think it goes back to my original, um, uh, my original uh, thought that I, I shared at the, at the outset, which is the importance of this process uh, to in, in enhancing the, the projects of the institution and really keeping communities at the heart of the bank's mission and, and for the panel's mission as, as well. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jolie. Very important thoughts. Imrana. Thank you, Dilek. So, um, a couple of key points I'd like to emphasize. The first of all is to you, our stakeholders out there. The panel will not change. We will not be doing anything differently. So we, our, our independence is preserved, even if we sit within a new mechanism. The panel members will continue to report to the board. We don't report to management, so that won't change. Um, we, uh, I, I would like to em emphasize also that um, our compliance review function is still there. It's still important. We will work hard to ensure that the compliance review function of the overall accountability mechanism is not reduced or depleted in any way. Um, I still believe that institutions learn mostly from compliance, but the most important thing is you, the stakeholders out there. I'm just so grateful that for those of you in Asia, for example, have stayed up so late to listen to us today. We really appreciate that partnership. We continue to look to you for support. We continue to want you to ensure that our processes are known to your communities so that you understand that this whole reform process has been about you. Thank you, Dilek. Thank you very much, Imrana and Jovi. So we've come to the end of our time. I want to thank our um, excellent speakers, Jorgen, Imrana and Jovi for your participation. And I want to thank all of you for watching or listening and for your excellent questions. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the recording, uh, the video recording of the session will be available later today. So I wish you a great rest of your day. Thank you very much.